About two and a half months ago, uh, me and we had about 12 bikers on motorcycles. We all left to Bainbridge and then we took off to Nia Bay, which is the northwest tip of Washington. It's about, from the ferry, it's about a three hour ride. And I remember uh, me and my buddies, we all, we were hungry, so we stopped by McDonald's, we ate some McChickens, and then, uh, and I remember my friend, he was like, you guys, we should pray for the trip. So God would bless us and keep us safe for the remainder of the trip. So we take off and we're cruising around. It's really twisty roads. And then I remember, uh, the last thing I remember is just waking up just under a guardrail. And my buddies were behind me and they were telling me what happened. Uh, basically, I was taking a right, like a, it was like a right turn kind of. And it was really steep and then it was like a really, really steep left. And I, I tried to straighten out my bike and I slammed on my front brake and I leaned into the left and my front wheel locked up and it was skidding at about 50 miles an hour. And my bike just goes straight into the guardrail and I'm going in with it. And my bike just totally went into the guardrail and completely broke into two pieces. The frame was just broken in half. And my leg was kind of still kind of stuck up and uh, I pretty much I had an open fracture. And the area of between the two posts, the guardrail is only about this high off the ground, maybe like two feet and maybe three feet wide. And it, my leg pretty much caught onto the guardrail and just threw me under the rail. And I, I hit my head, but very lightly. But I was kind of thinking about it. If it wasn't for my leg that stopped me, it could have been my arm or worse my leg or worse my head. So um, I get to, it was about three hours until I got airlifted to Harborview Hospital. And then I wake up and um, the doctors are telling me that there's a 50 chance, 50% 50 chance that they'll have to amputate my leg. So, um, and then they knocked me out and then I wake up later on and my leg is amputated um, below the knee. And I also woke up with um, pneumonia. My heart rate was at about 180 beats per second or beats per minute. Um, my temperature was over 40. I was coughing up blood in my lungs for about three days. I was going up into ICU, um, intensive care, and they were just really treating me. And this whole time, of course in the hospital, you're all drugged up and you don't really think about much, but I had a lot of support from my friends and a lot of people were there to, to help me and to, you know, to support me through this time. And the 10 days that I was there, I was really thinking about things that we had, the nice cars that we had, the nice houses that we had. We're gonna think about the things that we gave to people. And I was kind of looking back at my life and I was just really thinking, even though I don't have a leg, yeah, that's fine, but it's better to go to heaven without a leg than to go to hell with a full body. Because our life right now, it's very short compared to the rest of eternity that we're gonna have in heaven. Uh, praise God, amen? Amen. Uh, you know what's crazy? I, I really like, I really enjoy the testimony. And one thing that really hit me was, you know, it's better to give than to receive, right? Yes. There's nothing more remarkably special than the God of the universe giving himself for each and every one of us. There's nothing more remarkable than the Son of God coming down to the earth and dying on a cross for your sin and my sin. There's nothing more incredible than that, amen? Amen. Uh, before I actually get started on what I wanted to share with you guys, I just want to um, break the ice a little and, uh, and just say a story. You know, uh, being married, Andre, it's great. I, Thank you. Thank you. I highly recommend it. <laughs> but uh, um, one of the things I've been learning is really um, 
some of the things you find out when you're married, you know, like, um, you, you have no privacy anymore, you know? <laughs> um, one of, one of the interesting things is like, I was, uh, when we were dating, Mary and I, I went to the store to, to buy her some nail polish, okay? And uh, you ladies can relate, I'm telling you. When, you. when you go to the nail polish, this really shows how really flipped the values are in the world, really. I mean, you go to the nail uh, place and you're looking at the nail polish and, and, and it's like, the weirdest names I've ever seen in my life. It's like, you, and Mary was telling me this, uh, I think it was today or yesterday, but it's like, it's like, sinful temptations. <laughs> or like, lust, pride, you know? It's like, I'm like, godliness, no. Um, Self-control, nail polish, no. Oh, uh, you know, you can't, it's the many colors and they're all after, named after sins, you know? And it's like, so, uh, you know, I picked a few that weren't as bad and, um, and uh, brought them home, but, so, you know, what's really interesting to me is really um, the grace of God. I think, I think if I could talk about anything tonight more than anything else, it would be the grace of God. Um, I think, um, here's the thing, and here's the thing, uh, I want to make an explanation because a lot of people, um, they confuse the grace of God. Um, and what I mean by that is this, is when we talk about the grace of God, we mean by grace alone through faith alone. What I mean by this is that if you trust Jesus as your Savior in earnest and genuine faith, then that faith is salvation. Through that faith you have salvation in Christ. But some people they'll say this, they'll say, you know what, hey, um, that's, that's, um, that's very risky stuff you're talking about. I'll say, what do you mean? They'll say, you know, if you preach just grace alone, here's what happens. What happens is you get those people who are constantly battling with sin, constantly trying to overcome addiction, constantly trying to make a self-image of themselves and they can't own up to it. So, so they're, trying to, they're trying to hear this stuff and, and they hear that they're only saved by grace alone. So what do they say? They say, you know what, I'm just going to wallow in my sin and, and the more I sin, it's all good. You know, grace covers. And here's what I have to say to that, friends. In all of the Christian faith, grace does not only justify, grace sanctifies. What that means is that grace is powerful enough to justify you before a righteous and holy God right now. And it's also more powerful to take you from where you're at and bring you to another place. Amen? Amen. It doesn't leave you in your sin. And here's what I mean by that, guys. The real issue when we talk about Jesus is really what he said. Jesus' whole mission was based on focusing on one thing, and it was the heart of humanity. Jesus doesn't care about your works, doesn't care about what you do for him, doesn't care about how good you look. He cares about your heart. Because if he can change your heart, he can change everything there is about you. What the heart means is this. You know, in ancient Israel, the heart meant the whole being of a person. It combined emotion, will, and uh, desire all in one. And, uh, and really, when we talk about the heart, Jesus goes directly for the heart. And I just, uh, um, I just wrote down some scriptures I wanted to share with you guys today. This is directly from Jesus, so rest assured it's safe, okay? Okay, so uh, Matthew makes a really good uh, illustration of this, and, and this, is what, this is what Matthew records Jesus saying about the heart. Thank you. Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 12, 34 through 35. For out of the abundance of the what? Heart. heart. The mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Matthew 15, 19 through 20. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. I think it makes a really good point when we see what Jesus says about the heart in the sense that Jesus, looking at all of the religious figures in Israel, he says, you know what? My followers, listen to this, your righteousness has to what? 
exceed that of the religious leaders of the time. Now the religious leaders, they were very zealous. They were very perfectionist. You know, one of the things that I really like about Mary is she's a really perfectionist kind of gal. You know what I mean? Like uh, we, we, we came home today after church, or was it yesterday? It was, might have been yesterday. Terrible memory. But um, uh, we come home and, and one thing she doesn't like is that I, I come into the house and I start uh, taking out stuff that's, you know, I keep from work like highlighters or staplers. No, I don't care. But like pens and stuff and like paper and I'll just throw them somewhere around, you know, like just lay them down. Temporarily, of course. But uh, that really frustrates her. And, and then, and then uh, she comes home and I'm, and I'm just like, you know what? I think there's an idol of perfectionism here, you know? And I think... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so she tells me once, I was like, all right, all right, honey. And then she goes to the bathroom and then she comes out and I'm just chilling there, playing the guitar, smiling, and all my stuff all over the floor. And, uh, and, um, and you know, uh, it's, it's just interesting to me that there are things uh, that Jesus mentions that are not concrete things. Like you can't really put your finger on it. You can't touch it. You can't see it. I mean, it's, they're abstract. I mean, the things that he really talks about really relate to the very inward most part of a person's being the heart he doesn't come up to you and he says you know what I have a checklist for you to do and then when you meet that checklist guess what? I'm gonna love you no what he says is you know what your righteousness has to exceed that now when we think about that what do we think of imperfection the point of uh, a Christian life is that your righteousness is not your own is that God has given us a helper, the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity. And here's what he says. He says, you know what? I don't accept you as you are. I accept you as you are in Christ. I see Jesus crucified on the cross for your sin and my sin. And what the Holy Spirit does is he says, you know what? I will work that good work in you so that you have a desire, a motivation, an internal desire to be godly and to be obedient. If you try to be obedient on your own, you just can't do it. You will end up falling short every single time. And you know, here's the best picture that I can point, point to you guys is this. Sin is doing a pointless act from which nothing comes, only the need to do it again. Sin is the act that's a pointless act that has no outcome except the need to do it again. And here's what I want to say, guys. If we live in sin, we don't have joy. We don't have joy. And some of us are blind to that. Some of us pursue idols, physical idols. We run after cars, we run after houses, we run after money, we run after careers, we run after education, but that's all surface level stuff. What's the sin beneath the sin? There are idols, guys, that our heart is way, way blind to. I mean, without the Holy Spirit, you don't even know if you're in heresy right now. I mean, that's the, that's the real though, that's the fact, is that through the Word, the Spirit bears that conviction that reality of your heart and shows you how really wicked and how really in need and desperate you are of a savior. So here's what I want to say. Some of the sins that we see are abstract. They're underneath. They're in the heart. A lot of us guys, I mean, you know, just driving through the street, what do you see? Just driving from there to there, what do you see? The lust for approval. The lust to be a part of something. The lust to be worshipped by others or to worship others. But Christ says that will fail you. He says your approval rests in the cross of Christ. And the only way to have joy and gladness is to know that your sins are forgiven. That's the point of the gospel is to look at the cross, look at the Calvary and see Jesus bleeding badly and him dying. I mean. Jesus died. Jesus really died. That's how wicked our sin is. That's how bad it is. It killed God. But we don't, we're not left there, guys. We're just not left there. And I would, be, I would be stupid to leave you there. Because real joy and real perseverance and real obedience comes from what happened next. Jesus rises. Flesh and all, he rises from the grave 
heart pumping, blood pumping through his veins, and he says it is finished, it has been accomplished, it is totally overcome. Your sin is not big enough for Jesus. Amen. He can overcome it, and he has on the cross. And what he calls you today is not to fight to be a better person, he calls you to fight to believe. And to believe what? The truth, the objective truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are not your own savior. You have a better savior than yourself. You have Jesus Christ. And he knows every single detail about your life. And here's the really beautiful part. This changed my life. I mean, I'm telling you guys, this will change the way you live your life. If you look at the gospel as this, as Christ, as Ephesians says, before the foundations of the world saw your life from beginning to end, every nasty deed that you've done or every good deed that you've done with false motives, he saw that too. And guess what? And he died for that. He said, look, I'm going to see the life from birth to death and I'm still going to go on the cross so these people can experience true joy. Guys, is that not good news? What else do you need to hear other than the fact that your sins are forgiven? And guess what? He doesn't just leave you in your wallowing. He takes you from where you're at and He cleanses you day in and day out. The Holy Spirit is absolutely phenomenal. He is amazing. He will transform your heart's desires. No, not in vain the scriptures say that He will give you the desires of your heart. Is He going to give you your wicked desires? No. He's going to change you first. He'll change your heart. He'll change your thinking. He'll change your will. But do you trust Him? Do you trust Jesus Christ tonight, my friends? That's the real question. I just want to read a psalm before we end and continue singing. It's Psalm 51. It's a popular, popular psalm. I'm sure you guys know it. I'm going to read the first six verses. David cries out after he sinned and he says this, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly, thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is phenomenal. For I know my transgressions. Let me ask you a question. Do you know your heart? Do you know your sin? Can you name your sin? Can you see how wicked your heart is without Christ? And my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Basically saying that we are all fallen. You know, have you ever met a person who said they're perfect? I mean, really, they're like, I'm perfect. I'm perfect. You ever met that guy? They think uh, that the world revolves around them and everybody or anything owes them something. And they oftentimes meet you in the mirror every morning. And it's like, this is awesome. Hello, proud person. Okay, so, behold, you delight, this is important folks, you delight in truth, in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. He goes right, right down, right down deep. He doesn't go to surface level stuff. Oh, be good, go to church, read your Bible, pray. He goes deep, he goes deeper than that. He goes directly to your heart and he says, you know what? It's about Jesus and his work for you today. And you need to believe that. It'll change your heart and it'll change the way you think and it'll change the way you live your life. No longer enslaved to the idolatry of physical things or the idolatry of your own heart. But you're a slave to Christ. You trust Him with your life. And that will produce joy, my friends. That will produce joy. Guaranteed joy.